as a bit of an introduction, so just to explain who, who I am. So I'm Stuart Archdale. I um, head up the charity and care team at uh, PIB Insurance Brokers. I'm also joined by um, some, part, some of the partners from BLM Law, um, which is Sally and Michelle and Edward, who will be leading the session today and leading the question and answer sessions um, uh, around the subjects that we're talking about. Um, so uh, I will hand over to them predominantly in a little bit, but obviously I'll chip in if there's anything specifically insurance related. So in terms of the content, um, we've seen um, a fair amount of change. Over, I mean, I, I've worked in the charity and, and care sector from an insurance point of view for, um, for almost 15 years. And I have to say that the, the last year has been one of the most strange and unusual years. And I'm, I'm sure you've all experienced that, that the same. You've, you've, you've all um, grappled with, with the issues that have, have come up. And we've been here trying to support and guide you through that process as much as we can. Um, and that's been guidance changing on a daily basis, on a weekly basis, month by month. And, and I, we appreciate it's been very difficult to, come, um, to keep on top of. Predominantly, the conversations that we were having with our clients um, at the early stages of 2000, uh, as the early stages of the pandemic in 2020, were very much around, um, certainly from the insurance industry's point of view, um, how they will continue to insure you um, as your activities change, your day to day activities change, and what those day to day activities look like. More recently, we've seen the conversation start to shift towards maybe looking more at what the outcomes are, um, the potential for investigation, both internal and, and by external regulators, but also um, the potential of civil liability claims as well. And that's really what Michelle and Sally and Edward from, from BLM Law are here to, to discuss, and, and, and I'm here as well to chip in. So I'll hand over to, um, to Michelle and her team to make some introductions of their own. Okay, thanks very much, Michelle. Thank you for joining us today. Um, as uh, Stuart said, it's been a very interesting and challenging year. Um, I head the care sector at BLM Law and um, I'm also a disease expert and COVID-19 is ultimately a short tail disease. So the combination has meant that we've all been very, very busy over the last year. I mean, Sally and I and Ed have done a number of round tables and we've seen how this year has developed and we've learned a lot and experienced quite a lot in relation to those outcomes that Stuart was talking about. But the way we're going to have this session, it will be very interactive. I'll be asking questions of Sally and Ed, and hopefully we'll cover a lot of the things that are on your mind and that concern you. But if it doesn't, you always got the opportunity to ask further questions. Now, Sally is an HSE uh, expert and it deals with inquests and certainly has a great deal of experience in the care sector. And Ed is uh, also has an incredible involvement in the care sector, particularly over the last year, but is also a disease expert as well. So hopefully the combination of the three of us will give you some of the answers, hopefully, uh, of the uh, concerns that you have. My, my first question is going to be for Sally. Um, you'll all be concerned about COVID-related incidents or outbreaks, and they will have experience of this over the course of the pandemic. But what are the key steps to take to potentially prevent an outbreak? On what evidence will be important if there is one? Well, I think the obvious answer to this really is to keep up to date with the government's guidance on COVID. Obviously, as we've mentioned already, we've seen it change significantly over time and very often those changes have come into force with very little notice. Um, we are obviously now seeing a relaxation of the requirements and guidance in place, but we're constantly reminded that this can be reversed at any time should evidence of increasing infections dictate this. But I think to support that, obviously, we need to have systems in place to ensure the guidance is implemented. That's in the form of risk assessments, safe systems of work. But it's not just enough to do that, we need to regularly review and where necessary update risk assessments and safe systems of work. And that's particularly after any new cases of COVID and or new information or advice is released. So be reactive um, and, and dynamic, I think. Regularly communicate with employees. It's really important to do that. Provide them with the training and instruction around the systems in place and ensure that they really and truly understand what's required of them. And, and then to really just finish it, it off is testing the effectiveness of the systems. It's not just enough to have systems in place. You need to know that they're effective and workers can achieve compliance. Always, always document um, what you're doing. So the risk assessment process, um, systems of work, what training you've given, what communications are, are in place so that 
If you are questioned at a later date, um, you can demonstrate the assessment that was carried out, justify the measures taken and show that the situation had been kept under review. And I think, Michelle, in response to that, you know, what, what evidence is going to be important in the future? Well, a chronology of compliance set against the government and industry-wide advice and guidance is absolutely critical. It's continually evolving and it's so important that we're able to give evidence on what policies and procedures were in place at the time and then draw a comparison with the available information that, that was in place, demonstrate how and when that was updated since and why. And looking at this from a regulatory perspective, the regulators are going to look at how an organisation has responded to the pandemic, what measures it's taken, what measures it's implemented, and perhaps more importantly, what it's been able to implement and how that fits in terms of decision making against determining what is reasonably practicable, those words that we so often hear in the legislation. And that's going to be measured against the existing legislation as well as the guidance introduced in response to the pandemic, but it equally applies in the context of a civil claim, doesn't it, Michelle? It does. I mean, we'll talk about civil claims. And of course, we've been expecting, um, as a, one of my clients said, a tsunami of them, but we haven't had the tsunami. We're not quite sure what's going to happen with civil claims, but Ed will cover that off in a, a bit later. The first question um, from, from Helen and Nethercott is, um, What's your view of the guidance that restricts employees from working in more than one care provider? In terms of the guidance itself, I mean, it, it's always going to be very difficult, isn't it? But it, it's ensuring that the compliance is there uh, and that you're able to evidence that. I, I think we see that across care, uh, across schools, across nurseries as well, don't we? Where it's keeping everything very limited and contained. Um, the guidance is the guidance. And I think that we, we have to follow that and demonstrate it and have systems in place to be able to capture that information in the background as well to make sure that we're, we're able to demonstrate compliance. Um, you are reliant on employees to be, I suppose, truthful and honest with you about what their, their obligations are outside of work in terms of your work, um, but it's just making sure that you have that system in place to be able to demonstrate that you have made that effort to, to determine that. I think this goes back to, isn't the Vivaldi study um, that happened after the pandemic to sort of saw that actually the reason why their contraction was so high is where there were carers going to different facilities. So the bigger the care provider and going from sort of certain, say, one wall to another, et cetera, it meant it was more open to contraction. So if you have smaller care providers and carers that were not going from too many other sort of places, it meant there was less chance of contraction. And so I think that was the study that came out. I mean, the difficulty is, is when you're managing an employee who actually works at different care for different care providers, how are you going to compensate them for the fact they can no longer be employed by more than one? So it's it's one of those kind of interesting government guidance, which obviously we need to comply with, but there are practical implications for it. So, uh, sorry, Sally, I'm sure the, everybody here would like to have some information and advice about what they should do if there's been a fatality, in particular, and EL fatality, albeit they may already have need advice on whether there's been a PL fatality as a result of COVID. Mm -hmm. There's real confusion over read or reporting. Really, this is what this question's about. Um, we've had loads of questions and complications caused by read or reporting. Can you help with any of this, Sally? Well, I, I can to a degree. I think on the face of it, the guidance seems simple enough. But you're right, Michelle, so many businesses are seeing real challenges with this. And I think it's our number one question over time. We're understandably concerned that notifying the HSE of a non-reportable incident could result in an unnecessary investigation. And, but I think the real crux of it is it's so difficult to prove causation as it's so hard to determine with any accuracy where someone contracted COVID. And it's really a common th theme that we're seeing um, across all sectors. And I think some businesses are also concerned that a notification under a door may be misinterpreted as an admission of responsibility should a criminal or civil action be pursued later on down the line. And it's not always the case, but that's why we always stress caution when completing riddles. Um, and behind all of this, obviously, is the issue that a failure to report under riddle is a criminal offence in itself that can attract a significant fine or, or even potentially imprisonment. I think it's really important to emphasise here that the HSE guidance states to only make a RIDOR report when an unintended incident at work has led to someone's possible or actual exposure to coronavirus or where a worker has been diagnosed as having COVID and there is reasonable evidence 
that it was caused by exposure at work. So it's more likely than not that the person's work was the source of the exposure. And, and factors to take into account when making a decision on whether to report could include um, whether or not the nature of the person's work activities increased the risk of them becoming exposed to the virus, whether or not there was any specific identifiable incident that led to an increased risk of exposure, um, and perhaps whether or not the person's work directly brought them into contact with a known hazard without effective control measures in place, such as maybe the social distancing or PPE. But just going back to that reporting, how it's reported is really critical. You need to look very carefully about what information is contained in that riddle report. And it may be beneficial in the long term to go into some detail um, in relation to the potential causation on the reporting form. Normally, I'd say put as little as possible in a riddle as you, as you can, but not the case here because what you put in may actually assist you in the future. And, and I think really seeking assistance and advice in completing this is, is really important. Um, that ties in, I think, as well with, with establishing privilege as well in terms of, um, I mean, that could be a webinar in its own right, obviously, but establishing privilege is particularly critical in circumstances where a business intends to undertake an, an investigation into the circumstances, but also where there is potential for external investigations to take place and, and setting that up is really key, I think, as soon as possible. And, and doing that, obviously, being able to establish that would be seeking independent legal advice so that you can go and do your own investigation under that privileged banner. I think a lot of businesses also ask us whether the HSE will investigate all riddles. Well, I think given the potential volume of reports, the HSE may not be able to investigate them all, but there's just no way of knowing which one they're going to choose to investigate. And I think that's why, again, going back to it, the wording in the riddle is key and should be carefully considered. And at the very least, I think we can expect that the HSE may request a copy of your COVID policy. If on review, they've got concerns about the control measures in place, they may conduct a more in-depth investigation. And that could include going so far as to speak to some of your employees to take statements. As to whether the HSE will take matters further and whether they're going to prosecute if there's been a COVID related death, that's entirely dependent on the circumstances and the evidence. Again, causation is going to be very difficult um, to establish, but unlike in civil claims, the HSE doesn't have to establish that a breach caused the death. It's enough for um, the HSE to prove that the breach created a risk, and that's quite different. Um, the indication from the HSE so far has been that advice and enforcement notices will be the first steps, but prosecution is still an option. But that's only in the most serious of cases, and, and I think that remains the case today. Um, I, I think we also need to think about notification as well, Michelle, don't we, in terms of um, obligations to notify Public Health England, Public Health Wales. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be reported to the coroner if there's a death, because it is classed as a natural disease. Um, the only exemption to that will be, and it's, it is important, will be if the death also relates to someone's employment. So, for example, there are concerns about the care or delays of care in the lead up to the death. There may have been a failure to provide suitable PPE or protect employees or the cause of death may be unclear. And obviously, following on from this, it's also necessary to consider reporting requirements under the terms of your policy of insurance. And, and I'm sure that that's something that um, PIB will be happy to assist you with. Obviously, one of the confusion parts is when you do send information to the HSE, in particular a RIDA report or to the CQC or care inspectorate, how should you correspond with them? How much information should you give them? Uh, what are your yeah. duties? Well, we, we absolutely need to be cooperative with the regulators, but I can't stress this enough how cautious you need to be. They are a regulator, whether it be the HSC, the CQC or whoever the police, um, they will potentially be investigating a breach of legislation, which could have a significant impact on the business in the future. Um, and, and really, in some ways, it's quite counterintuitive to what we normally expect as the right way to do things. We, we always think of seeing, you know, the police, the regulators, well, let's just tell them everything. And, and so often we hear, well, we've nothing to hide. So we, we, we just want to tell them everything. It doesn't always transpire to be the best strategy in a regulatory investigation because we don't know what the regulators are actually investigating. They come with a very open-ended question set. 
and we don't know where they're targeting. So we could actually end up giving them information that, that draws up another line of inquiry for them. So we need to be very careful, very cautious. Having said that, the regulators do have a very wide range of powers and do have the power, for example, to request and even seize documents and seek witness statements from anyone the inspectors believe can assist with their investigation. So what I would suggest on a practical um, basis is that any communication should be encouraged to be in writing, maybe by email, rather than by telephone as possible, um, so that you can see exactly what they're requesting. And it reduces the potential for misunderstanding, both from understanding what the regulator is asking of you to you providing the information. It also ensures that the correct information is provided, um, but also enables you to put information into context, which can be helpful in the future. Oh, interesting. Um, Ed, I mean, you've had experience of what's going on in Scotland and how deaths are being investigated there. Could you just give us an outline of possibly the difference between what's going on in Scotland as opposed to England and Wales? Sure. Uh, firstly, I have to say that I am not a, a Scottish lawyer. I'm not qualified in Scotland. <laughs> and my experience comes from working alongside our Scottish um, BLM lawyers and for, for clients who have exposure both north and south of the border. Now Scotland is slightly different from what occurs in England and Wales and indeed Northern Ireland. So the Lord Advocate, um, who essentially is head of the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service, so it's that service that investigates sudden unexpected deaths, has decided to set up a separate team to investigate certain COVID related deaths. And those certain COVID related deaths are um, occupational related COVID deaths and all residential deaths within care homes. So that's, that's exceptionally broad. So you've got circa 474 care homes being investigated, circa 3000 deaths being investigated. This is, a, this is a huge enterprise to be undertaken. But what this means is that COPS, as they are known, has instructed um, Police Scotland to investigate each of those deaths. So that means they'll go into care homes, potentially take statements, interview um, care managers, take away documents. Alternatively, they may send questionnaires and correspondence to those care homes requesting disclosure. So, so what does this ultimately mean? Well, this could, could result in a criminal prosecution. It could result in a fatal accident inquiry. So, so in Scotland, they don't have the coronial system that we have here, they don't have coroners as such. The cops makes a recommendation and the sheriffs then investigate in the same way as a coroner would. So ultimately, you could be facing a criminal prosecution. You could be facing a fatal accident inquiry off the back of what you've provided. Now, exactly as Sally has said, you therefore need to take certain steps to protect your position to ensure you're not prejudicing your position. If this could ultimately um, culminate in a criminal prosecution, you have to ensure you're providing a factual response. You have to ensure where possible you're taking legal advice. This is the police that ultimately is investigating you. You have to have a clear chronology. I would recommend investigating any outbreak because in due course, if you are faced with a criminal prosecution or a fatal accident inquiry, you have to have su sufficient information to respond, to protect your position. If, if that's not enough, on top of this, uh, the Scottish government has indicated that they will be undertaking their own inquiry into their response to the pandemic, and that will include care home deaths. So it's not clear what form that will be, but it may well be that care managers and directors of large organizations will be called in to give evidence as part of an inquiry. So if in doubt, um, seek legal advice, notify your brokers, notify your insurers if the police are, are, are contacting you and making investigations. Mm. It's an interesting time, isn't it? Because uh, from what publicity from Scotland is that uh, they realise the Scottish government did make mistakes and particularly in relation to releasing or uh, discharging patients with COVID into care homes, which is something, a similar story that happened in England and Wales as well. Sally, we're going to get into inquests now, um, and it may well be the first time you, uh, someone becomes involved in, in a concern over a death is a notification from the coroner. Is there any particular advice you would like to give in relation to dealing with the coroner and inquest proceedings generally? Yes, well, an inquest is a fact-finding investigation to establish the circumstances into a sudden or unexpected death, and quite differently to most of the court processes that we are involved in, no fault or apportionment of blame can be made. And the purpose of an inquest is solely to establish who, when, where and how the deceased died, obviously as well as the medical cause of death. Now, coroner will investigate sudden and unexpected deaths that are reported to them and will adjudicate over the whole inquest process. They'll hear evidence from a pathologist in relation to the cause of death, 
as well as individual witnesses who can assist with answering those four questions of who, when, where and how. Now, an inquest is quite often the first public forum where causation is forensically considered. And although the findings are not binding, they will make their way into evidence, uh, which could be important in later litigation. And we are increasingly seeing regulators such as the HSC and um, the CQC, as well as claimant solicitors, using the evidence from an inquest in the parallel regulatory investigation or prosecution and civil claims. So it, really, they're seeing it as a good way for them to test the evidence and determine potential areas of weakness and almost have a trial run before they take their own um, proceedings further. But now, after the coroner's heard all of the evidence, they, or if there is a jury, the jury will reach a conclusion as to the cause of death. And in cases involving COVID, the conclusion may simply be one of natural causes or perhaps a narrative where the coroner will set out a brief description of the events which led to the death. And it might be worth adding here, actually, that these types of cases can often attract a level of media interest. And it's not unusual for local media to take an interest and report on inquests. So being prepared for that, having something ready to disclose um, with the approval of your insurers and perhaps advice from solicitors, having that ready on the conclusion of an inquest is always helpful. But as for communicating with the coroner, sorry, going back to your original question, Michelle, full cooperation must be given to the coroner. The coroner's in charge of their inquiry. It's a bit different to other legal processes and it's the coroner who's going to decide who the witnesses are, what evidence will be considered. And so ultimately, um, it's really important that you do cooperate with their requests. Okay, we're gonna to touch on uh, the duty of candor now, Sally, and there's been some new guidance. Um, is there any comments you'd like to make? Um, there's always been a concern about the duty of candor and the possibly potential of apologizing to a family member about say the death of a resident as a result of COVID and the concern about what insurers will think if you're apologizing. But what are the main considerations? What would be the main concerns about the duty of candor? Can you help on that? Yeah, it's, it's always a very difficult one, this, isn't it? And, and getting that parallel um, and making sure that you're not prejudicing your position. And I understand the concerns completely about that apology. Um, the updated guidance applies to all health and social care providers registered with the CQC. And, and there are certain duties identified in the legislation that you have to comply with. But the update is very helpful because it does provide a more detailed explanation of what a notifiable safety incident is but also critically now makes clear that the apology which is required as part of fulfilling the duty doesn't equate to an admission of liability. Um, and, and by the side as such, an apology will not affect a provider's indemnity cover. So the more detailed explanation of a notifiable safety incident confirms the three criteria that apply for an incident to be defined as notifiable. It must have been unintended or unexpected, it must have occurred during the provision of a regulated activity and in the reasonable opinion of a healthcare professional has or might result in death or severe or moderate harm to the person receiving care. But going back also now to that, that apology, the update also now quotes from guidance um, previously published by NHS Resolution, and that, which confirms that an apology is always the right thing to do. It is specifically not an admission of liability and it acknowledges that something could have gone better and is the first step to learning from what happened and preventing a recurrence. But it's that acknowledgement, I think, that something could have gone better that, that we really need to be careful about. And there are so many ways of expressing this. I think it's always advisable to seek advice on how that apology is drafted if faced with a, a particularly difficult scenario so that you protect your position in the future. Thank you, Sally. Um, we're now getting on to the sort of liability, the insurance part of this um, this forum. And I'm, the first question is going to go to Ed. Um, and in what context would you notify insurers or their bro or, or brokers about a potential COVID related claim? And are there policy coverage uh, considerations that should be considered at the point of notification? Um, can you help with any of that, Ed? Sure, I think I think that question probably has has two parts, mm -hmm. and and the first really is is, is what an, is a notifiable potential COVID claim, and the problem I, I assume that many people have is that COVID is ubiquitous. Millions of people have contracted COVID. It could be idiopathic. You, you you may have no symptoms whatsoever. So ultimately, what does that mean? I think if in doubt, and I'll probably be saying this a few times, if in doubt, speak to your broker, speak to your insurer, 
you're unlikely to be criticized for talking to your broker insurer and notifying of the claim. If you fail to, you may have repercussions. It may prejudice your indemnity under your policy of insurance. I mean, it seems perhaps more obvious that if you have a serious illness or death, that would likely be reportable. But if you have an outbreak, which suggests that there's multiple failures, in that instance, you may want to report that to your broker. If in doubt, I would report. Remember, your contract of insurance is a, a contract of utmost good faith. You have to be transparent with your insurer, have to tell them if any changes in your risk portfolio, if there are potential claims. So I think the first port of call is speak to your broker, speak to your insurer, check your policy wording. The second part of your question is, is what are those sort of real policy considerations? Do remember that there could be a number of policies of insurance that respond. It could be EL, it could be PL. You could have legal expense insurance, it could be DNO cover. So once again, go back to your broker, go back to your insurers, check your policy wording to see what can potentially respond. Re remember, you could be facing a claim where you, you could have an exception under your policy for COVID, for example, that, that there's no cover, but you could face a claim which covers two periods. So what will respond? Will, you know, will it be the time of diagnosis? Will it be the time of exposure? It's not abundantly clear. So in the same way as earlier when Sally was discussing, where you have an outbreak, where you have an incident, if you keep carefully documented documents, a chronology, you can then go and potentially evidence your claim to your insurer. So that's just as important. Also, I'd be very conscious of your policy conditions. Your policy conditions will require you to do certain things in relation to your workforce. It may be in due course, that will be an introduction of vaccination. And as a policy condition, you'll be required to vaccinate where possible your employees. If you fail to do that, that could mean that you have no policy cover or there could be some recourse from your insurers against you. So if in doubt, be sure of what your policy conditions tell you. Speak to your broker, speak to your insurer. And I just say transparency, quite frankly. I think there's an added question I'd like to add there, because obviously a number of people on this forum today may no longer have COVID cover for, for PL anyway. Obviously, EL is a compulsory insurance. Yes. But obviously during the pandemic and the renewal, the insurance industry got a bit, um, came a bit uneasy in relation, to, is that the right word? I found the right word. That's um, a good word. <laughs> it's a good word. They're very risk adverse. And obviously with the increased publicity of, of, of a residents dying, PL um, potential claims, uh, it became either, either the premiums became so high uh, that the obviously the providers decided not to go with them or it was just withdrawn. So a number of people in this audience, I expect, do not have PL cover, although I'm sure the advice would still be to tell their insurers about it. I mean, I'm particularly interested in these scenarios where you have EL and PL outbreaks at the same time, where the PL won't be covered, but the EL would. And I don't really see how you can actually deal with them separately. Um, but there you go. Um, but have you got any particular advice to anyone here who, has, who no longer has PL cover, where they're dealing with potential claims or incidents and what, the, what you think they should be doing? This wasn't prepared, Ed, so this is completely... It wasn't. Well, I, I think, I think <laughs> regardless, of, regardless of, of, the, of what happens, the outbreak, I think you should be taking the same steps in relation to documentation, chronology and witness statements, etc., as you said, I think I would go to my broker, I'd go to my insurer, and I would talk to them because they could recommend solicitors if there is a potential claim that is coming. Mm -hmm. Get ready to respond to a claim in due course. Mm -hmm. Remember that a personal injury claim could come three years down the line and memories may have faded, staff may have left, documents may be lost. So preserve as much evidence as you possibly can. Seek legal advice where possible, speak to your broker. You, you may subsequently have, you know, there could be other insurances which respond. You know, Your legal expense insurance may provide you with some advice, at least in relation to legal advice. It may be worth once more speaking to your broker. I just say, unfortunately, I think care providers are in a very difficult and unfortunate position that's not of their own making, but, but it is but it's unfortunately what it is. It is. Um, I'm just a bit concerned that usually people will send it to the broker, to the insurer, and the insurer's obviously got panel firms, they know what they're doing, and all of a sudden you'll have somebody that might not have been a, a kind of particular uh, land where they've just not been in before where they haven't really got that support and that's the kind of problem isn't it no exactly and your and your and your broker will will tell you you know your insurer will refer you to um you know lawyers disease lawyers specialists in that in that field they will provide you with some guidance perhaps and advice and and it's important therefore that you go to the right specialist at the right time and and you know you have enough documentation information to respond if something comes in due course because ultimately you're potentially uninsured so you need to protect your position perhaps even more so than otherwise do, could we see a repeat of something like what's coming um, in relation to things like um, noise-induced hearing loss or mesothelioma, where the claims are coming much later down the line? Well, they, you see, that's got a much longer latency period. You mm. see, 
with, with COVID, it's it, it, it's just short latency period. They're short tail diseases. There's only 14, a maximum 14 days between exposure and contraction and the illness. So it, with, with noise induced hearing loss, people may have been exposed in the 50s, 60s, 70s and 80s, 90s, and we're still getting the claims. And limitation is not an issue because it's from the date of knowledge. Now, the date of knowledge in a COVID claim is going to be fairly obvious. Yeah, I'm um, just thinking more you know, like long, long COVID and what the potential sort of more longer term impacts. I would say that. Yeah. There will still be that, but the limitation would still be the same from yeah. COVID. It, it, they might have developed long COVID, and usually people have already developed that. I mean, long COVID is just something that's going to happen over a, a long period of time. But you've got to remember, we've only had the disease for a year, and mm. we still really have no idea what the long-term impact of the conditions are. Obviously, there's huge publicity about long COVID. We could have done a whole session an hour just on long COVID, but obviously we just haven't got enough time. The, the only thing I would like to say, there may well be some people that, um, where we say about the three-year limitation, it doesn't apply when people don't have capacity. Obviously, children, obvious, but you will have elderly people that might not have capacity, and we do have claims in the care sector, which obviously limitations really set aside in those circumstances. So that's a possibility, but I can't see that as being the norm. Just to, just to mm -hmm. add that, you know, there are recent papers which indicate there could be neurological long term damage, etc. And uh, until all those reports until those studies are completed, you, you don't know whether or not you can make a claim. So it is possible that, you know, in due course, you know, when medical um, literature has, has sort of caught up, medical advice caught up, that you realise you have a cause of action. So you could see something more than three years time. It, yeah, it, is, it is possible. And it's something you need to be alive to. But generally, one, one assumes that you've probably got about three years from, yeah. from from date of contraction, date of developing the illness, but which is still a substantial amount of time. I don't, um, I mean, the limitation yeah. runs from the date of knowledge, not from the date of knowledge when it gets worse, or I, I don't know. I mean, it's an interesting one. I think we're going to find out, I mean, the, the next session, this is all about claims, and obviously we've talked about claims for a, a year. And I mean, I'm dealing with some claims, and I think we all have some claims, but we certainly haven't had the kind of level of claims that we've been potentially facing or concerned about. Um, I've just seen a question to claims farming. There's a lots of claims farmers out there waiting. Uh, lots of people think that the claims will come in at the end of the furlough, uh, where people, um, but this won't necessarily be the uh, in the care sector necessarily. But um, I mean, I've got my own views of what, what claimants solicitors and claims farmers are doing in relation to trying to find the right cases. Um, but anyway, let's just... Uh, anyway, as I said, we, uh, we you just, know, you're, sorry, so we just covered the previous on. question as well because it was one in relation to um, back to mm -hmm. Sally's point around duty of candor, which was um, mm -hmm. government is, um, is proposing a new safety investigation board for the NHS to share serious incident information. Will this affect the duty of candor? Well, I think it, it's a little bit too early to tell whether that is going to require an update or a revision in terms of the duty, and I think that will be for the for the CQC to work with the government in terms of what they're going to see. What I would say, though, is obviously to keep up to date in terms of how that develops um, and what the requirements are as your as a duty holder and, and for the future. Um, but the, I think the same advice will always be from our perspective is to treat everything with caution and, um, you know, whatever you're going to be sending out publicly, if you like, externally, is always revised, always checked, reviewed before that goes out. But just getting on to claims, obviously, as I've said, we haven't seen the claims, we've been expecting them. Um, and because of the publicity over the number of deaths in the care industry, obviously a lot of people have been expecting the PL claims, hence the withdrawal of from insurance by a number of insurers for that cover. But, you know, Ed, in your experience, what kind of claims can we expect to see if we get them? And can you give us an outline of the hurdles that claims have to get over to potentially uh, pursuing it successfully a claim? Sure. So, so I think you're, you're quite right, collectively, certainly as a legal profession and, and obviously insurers as well, collectively holding our breaths, waiting for this big swathe of claims to come in. And we haven't seen them yet. We have seen some claims, but we just haven't seen large waves come in as initially anticipated. And I, and I do think that's probably because we're, we're something of a perfect storm. And we know that I think in the first or two weeks before the first lockdown, a large number of case management companies were set up to deal specifically with COVID-19 to farm these type of claims. But the problem obviously occurred is that many claimant firms were themselves dealing with people going on furlough, um, dealing with paper light, working from home, etc. So they were desperately trying to deal with the claims that they had and catch up with what was going on. But if we look at the claimant solicitors' websites, we see that they're advertising for COVID claims, they're providing advice. We know that trade unions are advising their members in relation to potential claims. 
um, if their employees potentially breach their duties of care. So I do think it's a matter of when, not if. Uh, the second reason, I think, is because these are hard claims to pursue. These are hard claims to win. And, and the reason why I say that, uh, ultimately, a, a claimant's claim for liability is premised on, on, on two things. The first is breach of duty, and the, the second is causation. So ultimately, a claimant must prove that the duty holders breached their duty of care, and that breach has caused the illness, has caused the COVID-19. So if we just look at that first pillar, breach of duty, look at the period from, say, mid-February to late August, early September. The, the, the government was desperately trying to catch up and understand what was going on. As already Stuart's already indicated and Sally, guidance was either non-existent or intermittent and continuously changing. We know that there were PPE shortages. We know that um, people with COVID were being discharged into care homes or being untested. We know that there were issues in relation to testing. So ultimately care homes, care providers were putting this you know, untenable position that they couldn't possibly keep up with guidance and understand what's going on. And they couldn't mitigate and manage risk because they didn't have PPE. They didn't have testing. They were given COVID uh, patients essentially to deal with. There was no way around that. So for a claimant to get home, they must establish there's been a breach of duty. And I think that would be very hard, not impossible, but during that first period. Thereafter, I think it gets slightly easier because say at the beginning of September, I'm, I'm using a sort of slightly arbitrary date, Care providers should have caught up in respect of what they should be doing. PPE was more readily available. Testing was more readily available. There were still issues in relation to guidance, but guidance was better. At that point, you should be able to take reasonable steps to protect your employees from what was a national and international pandemic. So I do think if we're going to see claims, we're more likely to see claims from that period onwards in a second and third wave. But that's just breach of duty. That's not causation. The problem with causation from a claimant's perspective is that COVID-19 is ubiquitous, it, it, it's omnipresent. You can just as much catch it picking up the post and going to the shop as you can within your workplace. So it's very hard and near enough impossible for them to say, I caught it in an occupation rather than at home. The position from a claimant's point of view perhaps gets slightly easier if you're looking at a closed residential environment where you're not having visitors and you've only got one potential source of exposure. Another possibility is where you have a multiple outbreak during a small period of time. That suggests that there's been a breach and a failing. Uh, you know, and for causative reasons, it may be easier for them to get home in that regard. But, but that's not the total answer, because for them to get home, for a claimant to get home, they must show that their negligent exposure, the defendant's negligent exposure, has caused the condition. And, and let me give you an example. If you've got a, a care worker working for a 10 hour period and for, for nine hours, and um, they follow all guidance, they have their face masks on, et cetera, but for one hour, they don't. Now, now we know, um, evidence suggests that you can, you can transmit um, COVID regardless of wearing PPE and following all the guidance. You know, it's, it's an easily, con a very contagious disease and certainly new strains are more contagious. So you cannot say with certainty whether that nine hours where you were doing everything perfectly or that one hour has caused the COVID. So there are serious difficulties for a claimant to get home. But if we do see claims, I think it's more likely to come from that second period, so from late August, early September onwards, and in closed care homes and or large outbreaks. That's what I think we'll see. But I just go back to the fact that if that is the case, it's once more important for you to document everything that's occurring. If there's an outbreak, to ensure you're taking statements, ensure you're creating chronology, notifying your insurers at an early stage, potentially getting legal advice. I think it's very important to protect your position. And as Stuart said, we could be seeing claims in you know, many years time, three years time, or perhaps longer. I mean, it's an interesting because we've been researching what the claimants have been doing ever since the pandemic hit, and we haven't had the claims. And I'm sort of, they obviously, See, at the end of the day, the claimant solicitors who run these cases in the end um, want to get paid. They're only going to get paid the claims are successful. So I think the claims they're going to pick initially are going to be the ones that they see as the strongest. Therefore, the cluster of claims, the outbreaks, will tend to be easier to prove on causation, potentially. I, I totally agree. Time. So that so it may well be they'll advertise for claims of people that may have had you know been involved um, with a covid related illness who might have worked at a particular care provider they may well they may well advertise in terms of any kind of pl setting in terms of do you have a member of family who was at a, a care home now you can look for this we research this now and again to see what's going on on websites on these claims farmers to see if they are actually targeting certain areas 
But anyway, I'm going to go on to the next one about vaccinations because I think that sort of flows quite nicely with what you've been talking about, Ed. And obviously, vaccination and tests in the care sector is a particular problem um, because, you know, the care sector looks after the most vulnerable people in our population. Is it possible to make vaccinations compulsory for all staff and what difference would it make? Um, does testing help at all? So it's a big, big question really there, Ed. It is. Um, I, I suppose it's the most topical of what is a topical subject anyway and what's been going on. I'm sure we've all um, read or heard about Pimlico plumbers and the like saying no jab, no job. And so ultimately, what does that mean for you? I think I'd go back to first principles on all of this. You know, if, if, if we look at the Health and Safety at Work Act 1974, ultimately it's ensuring that there's a safe environment for your workers and for those within that environment. And one of those measures, one of those mechanisms to manage and mitigate against the risk of injury and illness is potentially vaccinations. Now, the efficacy of vaccinations, of course, is, is not 100%. We, we know that it doesn't necessarily guarantee that you will not get COVID or serious illness. We don't really know what it means at present in relation to transmissions. The suggestion is that it may help limit transmission, but it's not yet known. And uh, I think studies are still ongoing in that regard. However, it seems to me that when you're looking at a care home or a hospice, you're, you're talking about a very vulnerable population. And you're talking at these individuals who are more at risk of serious illness or death than perhaps elsewhere than say in an office. And therefore it seems to me a, a reasonable step to manage that risk would be to vaccinate your employees who are also at risk because they can't social distance. They have to work with individuals, they have to care for them, et cetera. So you've got you know, both categories high at risk. It seems to me that it's a reasonable step. The, the problem of course occurs then if you're asking your employees um, to become vaccinated and they refuse, what then happens? Well, just as much as an employer, as a duty holder under the 1974 Act is required to mitigate and manage risk, an employee is required to assist their employer with managing mit mitigating that risk. And ensuring a safe workplace. So it's arguable, and the jury is still out, it's arguable that if they refuse to be vaccinated, perhaps you could dismiss them on that basis. But the problem obviously occurs that what if you've got an individual who, who can't be vaccinated because for medical reasons they've been advised that perhaps because they're pregnant or they've got another condition, it could cause them an adverse effect. And we've seen recently um, lots of these about potential blood clots um, from some vaccinations that occur. What happens if someone has religious or philosophical views? Um, is there potential for discrimination claim? I think we go back to what we, we, we said earlier on, it's about a balancing act. Unfortunately, as a duty holder, you're obliged to ensure you mitigate and manage that risk of illness and injury. So you need to do that. I, I, my personal view is, and I know some people have different views, that you should therefore be taking in a hospice or a care home environment, that vaccination step, regardless of the employment issues. But that doesn't necessarily mean that you can't do anything about those employment issues that arise. There, there are ways to manage that. There are consultations, the usual sort of approach that comes with that, understanding whether or not you could put that individual in a, in a different role within the organisation. I, I, and I go back to what I said earlier on about policy cover. In due course, it may well be that your PL policy, indeed your EL policy stipulates that your employees have to be vaccinated or best endeavours to be vaccinated. If that says that and you don't do it, arguably also you're without cover in that regard for your employees. Well, there could be could be concerns there. I'm not sure, I'm sure if that helps or answers the question, Michelle. I think mean, it's a very confusing area. Really. There was so much publicity about the percentage of carers that we're going to refuse uh, that I haven't looked at it recently. I think it was quite a high percentage of carers. Um, and also you've got uh, younger women and the idea of the AstraZeneca uh, causing um, blood clots. So until they get a different, obviously, vaccine, and there's a lot of obviously carers around that age, uh, females, obviously, in the care industry. So it's not an easy one. I mean, I think, I think when you're taking on someone new, you can obviously have something in their contract, but obviously for, for your employees, it's a variation of their contract. And ultimately a vaccination is a medical treatment and enforcing a medical treatment is not straightforward. Um, there's been so many articles and information about this. I'm sure this is just a, a tiny part of it, but I do think you need it's very detailed advice, particularly if you've got employees who are refusing to be vaccinated and what, what the next appropriate steps is probably from the employment lawyer. Um, but yeah, it's a very confusing time. Um, Ed, the only last question I wanted to ask you was about the government assurance scheme. Um, I don't know if everybody knows about this, but that enables families of frontline workers who have died as a result of COVID to claim £60,000. Um, there's not been a great deal of publicity. Um, the scheme came into fruition earlier, earlier last year, obviously after the pandemic. Um, 
I mean, we've, we've noted that a number of our clients are applying for this, but is there any guidance you can give to people here about the scheme and what they should do in relation to it? Sure, I think it goes back to the law of unintended consequences. In, in short, obviously, you know, there's good intentions behind the scheme, understandably so. You know, you want to ensure that the, the family of a deceased employee, you know, are getting benefits if possible. The problem occurs is that the Secretary of State requires, if you're signing a declaration under this form, essentially saying that this is an occupational death. It's more likely than not that this is an occupational death that's occurred within the care setting. The problem, if you're putting your name to that as an employer, because you're required to sign it and provide that declaration, is that it could have an implication upon a criminal prosecution against you, a civil claim or an inquiry. But unfortunately, because this is all very new, we're not entirely sure how it will be used and, and when it will be used. Um, looking at the rules um, in relation to scheme, there is a caveat, there is a disclaimer in relation to um, legal liability. It does say that payment under the scheme does not amount to an admission. Unfortunately, the information you provide can still be used within that. So I would recommend seeking advice before you um, sign the declaration and provide this. It may well be that you can provide a caveat within the form saying that you've complied with all your legal duties and the death has not been due to your negligence or any breach of those duties. But failure to do so could prejudice your position. So something which has got great in good intentions ultimately could have a detrimental effect on your position in a criminal or, or civil claim. Very interesting. As I say, what we're doing, obviously, our clients are asking and making sure that people are aware of this. We think people have got a duty to advise any family members of, of anybody that obviously has passed away due to COVID or a frontline worker um, to actually tell them about it, but to ensure that any applications are vetted um, very very carefully before they are sent off because you don't really want to deny a family member £60,000 if they're entitled to it but obviously you don't want to cause another added headache as a result of it so that's that's the issue there. I would say, uh, so, sorry Michelle I sorry to interrupt you I would say there was a, a, a small point is that if you've read or report or not read or reported something mm -hmm. but under the form you're saying we think we consider this probably an occupational death there could be a clear conflict there and you could be undermining your position. So if the HSE in due course finds out that you haven't read or reported, they get hold of this document, they may start asking questions. And as Sally indicated earlier, it could result in potentially a prosecution for breach of riddle. Wow, so that 60,000 pounds would be, yeah, there you go. Right. <laughs> Every cloud. <laughs> um, well, we've run out of the our, our sort of prepared questions. Is there any other questions that the audience would like to ask any of us? There was one sort of it wasn't necessarily picked up any re in relation to you, you you talked about claims farming companies um mm -hmm. in when he'd, he, he'd asked that uh, in, we talked about it in relation to the more straightforward if you like employers and public liability claims um but part of what he'd asked also is about stress related claims oh yeah Do we expect the stress any uptick in stress in the back of um people who've had to to go through actually quite a challenging work related time um over the course of the last 12 months well, these are sort of what we call the related COVID potential claims rather than direct COVID claims. And we've obviously been discussing a great deal about the potential for stress claims, particularly in the care sector. I mean, certainly in the first wave, um, you know, the carers were going through an awful time. Obviously, lots of people that they cared for were dying. Uh, they was working hugely long hours. Some of them obviously had moved, you know, I think some of them have had tents in gardens where all sorts of you know stranger things were going on um, and some of them obviously were frightened to go into work they didn't want to contract the disease they didn't want to give it to their family um, some people feel that it was made to go into work when they didn't want to I mean so will we see stress cases we've been talking about that for a year as well um, possibly um, you know most of the stress law we've got really indicates that um, just because you're working in a very difficult environment doesn't mean to say that you can actually pursue successfully a stress related claim. It has to be a lot more than that. There has to be a breach of duty. So, um, and there's got to be foreseeability if it's, if it's kind of a work related stress claim. So you'd have to know that, that particular person was vulnerable. I mean, the law of stress, I mean, it's a bit, to be honest, the, Pursuing COVID claims and pursuing stress claims are very similar because they're very difficult for the claimants to prove successfully. Just because you're suffering a psychiatric injury and it, which could be related to work doesn't mean to say it's been caused by someone's negligence. So um, again, uh, we might see some claims, just to say we might see some COVID claims, but I, 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 you know, the, as I say, I think the claimants, this will be, they're, they're very expensive and very complicated claims to pursue successfully. And um, for the claimants to, um, indulge themselves and pursuing lots of them, I'd be very surprised. 
uh, psychiatric reports are very expensive, for example. Um, they're very, very difficult to investigate and very complex. And again, they want to get paid by the end of it. So again, are they going to pursue lots and lots of stress claims? Ed, Ed do you want to add to that? Because I know we've been but talking well, about this for the last year, haven't we? We have. All I'd say is that the claimant, forms are, claimant firms are like any other business. You know, they, they, they want to make profit. They want to make money. And these are difficult, expensive claims. And COVID claims themselves are difficult and expensive, and so are these stress claims. So uh, I, th I think they'll only choose the best of the crop, and we won't see, at least first, perhaps the fodder. But once a precedent has been set, once we see cases coming to trial, and you know, and there being clear judgments, I do think more will follow, and you know, and and the bold will start to roll, as it were. Yeah. That's the thing that Ed and I are trying to avoid. We're all trying to avoid judgments because we think if there's a judgment, it will possibly in favour of the claimant and it will set, um, it will, you know, it's set hairs running basically. I, th I think it's fair to say that perhaps one of the concerns is that you know there will be um, understandably um, policyholders without insurance and therefore without cover, and they will be required to meet a, a claim which they are not best suited to respond to. And so therefore it's important that we educate where appropriate because we could end up with a precedent set un unwittingly by someone who's not experienced in perhaps the disease field. So therefore it's important, you know, as an industry to understand what's coming down the line. What um, do we think, I mean, we talked about precedent setting there. I mean, we all, we all know um, in, in relation to things like um, employers and public liability claims, often they don't reach trial, they are settled beforehand. And um, in your experience so far, um, or, um, you know, feel free to say yes or no to that. Um, but are, are we seeing are we seeing um, instances where um, claims have, have actually happened already and they have been settled? All I would say is is that insurers are as conscious as anyone that that you want to run the right claims and not the wrong claims. I think that would be fair right. to say. But, but I don't yeah. have any knowledge of, of, of that directly. I mean, the only ones I'm dealing with, we're defending. Um, you know, there have been some, I mean, I've, I've got a portal, um, long COVID claim, EL, bizarrely, not in the care sector, someone who was assisting a, a couple in their home. And um, it's been dealt with as an accident claim. It's a very odd claim. Um, but I mean, the insurers, I mean, most of the insurers that are dealing with these claims de are dealing with as disease claims. They know that if they start settling them, they will have hundreds and thousands of them. They know that even if you have a very low value COVID claim, you do have to throw quite a lot of time and money at it to make sure you defend it successfully, as we do in most disease claims, because it really, they tend to have a tail of claims. So mm -hmm. if you're in a, if you're a care setting where you've got an outbreak and there's lots of um, potential COVID diagnosis, or fatalities you've really got to look at each one individually and investigate them very very carefully because once you settle one you're in trouble i think it's important not to look at civil claims in isolation it's, it's all part and parcel of a coroner's inquest the cqc and HSE, hse um, investigations and potential prosecutions it's all as a whole so at the moment certainly insurers and policyholders are are seeing initially the coroner's inquests the CQC, HSE investigations, which then could potentially lead to a civil claim. So it's important that the hard work's done now, so in due course you can you can respond. And I know I've I've been banging that drum for the, the whole of the time, but I think that's important. I think that's the message really to, to give. Yeah, I mean, what, 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 when I get involved with a civil claim, that sometimes you get involved with a civil claim at the same time as the inquest, and you have to work very carefully with each other. I mean, Sally can obviously add to that, but, you know, the, the civil claim will mirror what's going on in the inquest. You can't look at it separately. You know there's going to be a claim coming, so you've got to sort of, it, it, a bit like if you was dealing with a, a stress claim and an employment tribunal claim, is exactly the same idea. Yeah, I, know, I know a recent coroner has indicated that they may, at a PIR, pre-inquest review that they may make a finding of an industrial death or so that can then have an implication and uh, and fuel a civil claim potentially coming so you know it's it's something really to bear in mind so in terms of i mean yeah from my perspective you know you, Ed, edward you've talked throughout this about you know making sure that you're informing um your insurers and your insurance brokers obviously that's that's the capacity that we act in for most of you so it's it, i think it is a case of um yeah don't be afraid to talk to us it's um it's I, I always say it to a lot of my clients and uh some of you on this call you know it's the quiet ones that i worry about um the ones that don't <laughs> talk to us so it is um it is a matter of, of of getting in touch with us and saying you know this is this has happened that there's no problem with doing that even if we're going to say look okay we're not at a stage where we need to go further with this or you know actually let's let's involve the insurers at this stage even just to to put it on record with them but the reality is the sheer volume of covid claims over the last last year have, have meant that to be honest they've taken 
probably unless something's progressing much further towards inquest or progressing much further towards um, more of a civil litigation aspect, um, the insurance is taking relatively little interest at this point because they want them on record, but they don't really want to take them further. There's no suggestion beyond that. I think it does still come back to the point of making sure that your investigation is right um, in, in doing that. I don't know if my internet has gone here. Another question here, um, uh, as it is important to follow guidance, can you provide any advice for ways to feedback to the government when they issue guidance that they cannot, that cannot practically be followed? Um, all the comms links they publish are quite impenetrable. That might be one for Sally, possibly. Yes, and what we've seen, yes, absolutely. What we've seen with other industries and other sectors is that they have um, been working with their industry supporters. So, for example, in the bakery world, they've been working with the Federation of Bakers to work together across all organisations, um, feed in information and present that to, in this case, the health and safety executive to almost lobby the health and safety executive in terms of what is and is not achievable and realistic that that related to PPE because when we first saw the outbreak they couldn't get the requisite PPE in place because it was all being diverted to the NHS so they literally could not make the food that we needed to to eat and sustain the country um, so I think that that's something that, that could be looked into in terms of um, approaching rather the government but going with the regulators the CQC the HSC who are setting out the guidance and advising the government and do it that way rather than going direct um, perhaps through the websites um, and doing that as, as a group a collective if you like. Can I just sort of add to that I mean obviously you've got you can do that but also you do need as a group to minute and discuss if you have a if you have a difficulties in complying that you have it all minuted and why why that is the case so you can pick that up on evidence so if a claim comes in you can turn it into a witness statement it's a bit like when I investigate a disease claim and I see a risk assessment that's not particularly adequate but you can get a, you can get a witness statement which deals with why it's not inadequate or any issues with it which might cover it off. You, you need that evidence so you, you can pick that up as you go along. I imagine that everyone on this call is also familiar with uh, Dr. Cathy Gardner, who's um, mm -hmm. taking judicial review against the government for their failings. And I think that will be interesting. I think that's going to be heard um, mid part of this year and, and see exactly what the outcome of that is and what that means for you as care providers, because if the government obviously have considerable failings. What does that mean in relation to your culpability for these claims? Yeah, I mean, just in case people don't know about the Dr. Gardner one, I mean, she and, and another lady lost their father in a care home at the beginning of the pandemic, and they've pursued human rights claims against the government rather than actually a claim against the care providers. And I think this is one of the interesting things at the start of the pandemic, when everybody expected claims against the care providers, and all of a sudden we had this very high profile human rights action against the government, blaming the government for what they were doing. Um, and she's got crowdfunding of about 120,000 now and uh, QCs. It's very, very high profile. That should come out at the end of April, early May. Um, and I think this will, I think the claim, some of the claims will be waiting for the outcome of that because if, if indeed the government is, is to blame, it might impact on the ability to pursue claims against care providers, particularly during that period of time. And then um, a final question was possibly one for me, which is do I need to start budgeting significantly higher insurance costs? Um, I think um, it probably depends on what your starting point um, is um, as to whether they're going to significantly increase and, and your other claims profile, if there are other claims ongoing, those are also factors. Um, it, it's, very it's very easy to look at everything being solely about COVID. Um, as, as Edward's alluded to, throughout this is a lot of the insurers are restricting or, or removing any public liability cover that, that creates the difficulty for insurers and I think that there is some increase um, I think some some of you may have seen it already I think there is some increase coming um, I, I, for some it probably won't be as drastic as others um, but but for some yes yes there is there is increases coming I think um, budgeting more for your insurance spending the coming year I think would be very sensible.
I've just seen a question about testing and about obviously carers having to go to more than one provider. And of course, testing does, I, mean, I was going to ask Ed about testing, but I think I it, we overlooked it in the end. But testing is obviously a really important part of it. You're talking about the lateral, lateral flow testing where you get the results in half an hour or so. So obviously that does make a difference, but obviously they're not foolproof. Um, we know that. So it, it's, obviously, it's certainly better than nothing. And it, it, obviously it's not something that we had right in the beginning of the pandemic when obviously the contractions were so high and the contagions were so high so that obviously testing is, is, is a crucial part particularly for visitors as well um Ed, did you want to say anything about that yes, i think that's all the point you know the efficacy of testing is is, is questioned it's not 100 percent foolproof uh, and we know that so it's just one measure as part of all the other measures you're putting together so it certainly helps have a documented measures in place but ultimately it's you know it's not it's not a panacea and that's unfortunate but I, I do think that care providers are put in ultimately an untenable position, um, you know, and, it, and it's exceptionally unfortunate. So it's it's choosing the lesser of two evils. It's it, it's trying to balance risk as best you can to reduce the risk of illness and injury above all else. Um, what, what do you make of the government indemnity scheme, the limited scheme that it is? The, the, well, um, I, th I think probably it's coming to a very rapid end. To quite. Yeah. Be quite honest, the government indemnity scheme, but it's, mm. it's effectively there for designated settings which are settings in which um, a hospital patient with COVID-19 would be discharged into before going on to a an alternative care facility um, and the number of designated settings was was relatively small and the uptake wasn't there. Um, part of the reason the uptake wasn't there was because um, insurance companies were very reluctant at the idea particularly from an employer's liability point of view of having employers and um, sorry employees um, exposed to what is effectively a COVID ward, um, specifically COVID ward, um, it puts them at a higher risk of um, contracting COVID um, much higher than, than in say other care settings where COVID may be present but relatively low levels. Um, I think this was the difficulty of, of probably getting HM Treasury and, um, and the insurance industry and everybody to see eye to eye all at the same time. Um, yes. And I think probably by the time it was really um, up and running and in full force, I, I think we're probably coming to the end of really when it was was probably needed. Um, hopefully we won't need it again. And we are in a situation now where actually many of the designated settings have been closed down mm -hmm. um, because there isn't the same need there as there was. Um, and, and the hosp hospitals aren't under such stress to be able to, to need to um, discharge those patients out of inpatient beds within hospital settings. Um, so I, I think I think it's there. I think I think there's a lot of complexity around it, around how it will operate and how it will dovetail with um, uh, insurance provision and uh, and the question marks of, of asking each insurer to make decisions on how they will dovetail with the government indemnity scheme was, was quite difficult as well. And I think for those reasons, I think it, it um, the guidance wasn't there to be able to let people make use of it effectively from from probably when it was needed, which was a bit earlier on in in. Mm -hmm. Over the, over the winter really so so once more good intentions which didn't really result in, in anything of much use um I, I hopefully i think we are in in, in the scenario and hopefully we don't come into this scenario again um there is something there that's a bit more readily available for people to to resort to if we if, if it should be needed